turn in your Bible over to the book of Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. So we continue our series, Trojan Horses in the Church Today. Of course, a Trojan horse, the idea is it is something that seems wonderful. You invite it into your midst, and then in time what happens is that thing ends up destroying you, ends up causing problems for you. I won't go into the history because of the time of that. Go back to message one where I give the foundation of what a Trojan horse is and where that whole concept came from. But that is part of our vocabulary today. It is part of our dictionary, this idea of Trojan horses. Now today we're covering one that you might say, well, I don't understand how this fits in there. And maybe you won't understand it because this is... This is um, uh, it can be very serious, but at the same time, if you're a discerning person, it won't be as much of a problem for you as somebody who's especially a new believer or somebody who's not even a believer yet. And it is the issue of the, Tro it is the Trojan horse of study Bibles and commentaries. Study Bibles and commentaries. Now, hear me out on this, because a lot of you have study Bibles here today. Uh, and I will explain very clearly, I'm not against study Bibles, okay? But I want you to understand why this can be a Trojan horse and also commentaries. And by the way, even, uh, even Bible apps and Bible study software will be going there as well. The Trojan horse we are looking at today is actually two of them combined, possibly three combined. And I realize what I have to say today is more of a caution than an absolute. Now, up to this point, they've been absolutes, okay? This one is more of a caution than an absolute. But it is absolutely important that I talk to you about it. Because this is a serious problem. It is based on my educated opinion, my observation, experience, and more importantly, the truths and the principles found in Scripture. And so that is where we're going with this. Now, study Bibles and commentaries can be helpful to all of us at times. There's no question about that. And so I want you to understand, study Bibles are, in a sense, you might say, well, what is a study Bible? I don't, I, I, what does that mean? Aren't you supposed to study every Bible? Yes, you're supposed to study every Bible. But a study Bible, what it does is it puts like book introductions, outlines, and it'll put commentary and notes underneath the text. Uh, those, those notes are on the same page as the text itself. Now, most of you know that. Okay, but for those who are new to the faith, uh, you, you, you're just recently saved, you may not be familiar with them, and um, uh, so we need to address this. This is an important thing to address. Study Bibles are, in a sense, short commentaries and other information coupled with, now listen, coupled with the text of Scripture. Now, if you think about that, you realize the potential for problems with that. When I trusted Christ as Savior, several Bible college students pooled their money together and they bought me a 1917 Schofield Reference Bible as a gift. They not only bought me one, they bought me one with a leather cover. They not only bought me one with a leather cover, it was goatskin leather. At the time, it was a very, very expensive Bible. And here are these poor Bible college students, but because they had a burden for me, I had just gotten saved a couple days before, and they went and they pulled their money together and presented it to me. Well, I didn't know what to do with it, you know. Honestly, I thought they were loaning it to me for a church service. And he said, no, that's yours, that's yours. And by the way, I still have it in my library, that study Bible. The Schofield is one of the oldest and, in my opinion, still the best study Bible on the market. Now, that's my opinion, okay? But I have reasons to believe that. It doesn't have a fancy layout with all the in-text maps and charts and now full color. A lot of your study Bibles now are coming out in full color. So it's, it, it doesn't have all the fancy stuff, but the notes are probably the most sound notes of any study Bible. Do I agree with everything? No. So let me say that right away. 
So uh, you were, somebody was probably watching halfway through an email. You were going to send it to me and say, what about this passage in the Schofield? Okay, that's why I just said what I said. I don't agree with everything in the Schofield notes. But if there's any study Bible I agree with the most, it would be the old Schofield 1917 edition, which, by the way, we still sell in our resource center here and uh, we have bonded leather ones, which is a nice, their bonded leather at Oxford is a nice bonded leather. We have them for $20. And it is a, it is a good Bible, okay? There are a few places where I would disagree with the notes, but overall I think they are the best. Uh, that, of course, has been followed up in recent years with the Schofield 3. It's called the Schofield 3. That has augmented notes in it and is more accommodating to subtle errors, subtle errors. And some people wouldn't even notice them, uh, those, those augmented notes uh, as far as some of the things that have been added. Very, very subtle, okay? Uh, there's, not a, there's not a lot of drastic change or anything. I'm just letting you know. Now, we also have that one here, and we also sell that one through a resource center. Um, and overall, it's a, it's a good study Bible, if that's what you're looking for. So I'm not against study Bibles. Do we understand that? However, you, if you get a study Bible, you need to be very cautious with that study Bible. What I have to say today also goes for both study Bibles and commentaries. Now, commentaries are, are books that are used alongside of or in conjunction with the Bible text. Basically, it's somebody's writings, and they're writing a commentary about the text, verse by verse, section by section, and so forth, and, uh, and I'm not against them. Bible dictionaries would fit into here as well. You got to be careful with Bible dictionaries, by the way. And let me, let me say this. Now, I, I recommend the Strong's Concordance and Lexicons, uh, Hebrew Greek Lexicon in the back of the Strong's Concordance. I still recommend that. I think, I think the Lexicon in there, the dictionary, is an excellent one. It is basic, but it's, it's overall, it is, it is right on. And I don't think the others really have a whole lot to add to it, to be honest with you. And I've got them all, including uh, Arden Gingrich and, and uh, some of the others. Uh, but here's, here's the point, okay, folks? The authority is the Bible. The authority is not even Strong's. Do we understand that? He was, a, he was a fallible man. By the way, he was a Calvinist. He was a fallible man. And his lexicon and dictionary is probably one of the best you're going to find. But you don't base your theology on Strong's. You base your theology on the Bible. This is the key. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5, it says this, Every word of God is pure. Now, you understand my emphasis in reading? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, rebuke thee, and thou shalt be found a liar. <laughs> Those are pretty strong words there. Every word of God is pure. Okay, He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So let's look at these. First is study Bibles. Uh, it, can be a very, it can be very helpful to have information readily available in your Bible. In other words, you're on a page or you're, you're beginning a study or reading through the Bible, and there's an introduction in your study Bible, and it tells you what the book is about, and then it'll give you an outline and so forth. That can be helpful as you approach it. If what it says is true. How many of you just heard what I said? Okay. Because if what is said is not true... It's going to give you a false interpretation, a false idea before you ever get into the text. And that is when it becomes a Trojan horse. And you need to be careful. Whenever you put the notes of man on the same page as the Word of God, you have to be careful. The human mind, this is just the way it works, folks. The human mind wants to equate the notes as having the same authority as the Scriptures 
themselves. Why is that? Because there is something called the power of print. Let me tell you something. You can write a long letter on a napkin or notebook paper and handwritten, and it's there, and that's all fine. You know, and somebody can, and you can say to somebody, hey, I wrote this, and why don't you read it? And say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll read it, and, and it's in a notebook. But boy, I'll tell you what, you get that thing published in print with a fancy cover on it and a nice typeface and the code on the back and all of that, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, there's some authority here. Well, not necessarily. But that is the nature of print. That is the nature of print. This is so important to understand. Not only that, there is a naivety in new believers who are just starting to grow. I'll give you an example of this. And Larry, I don't know if I ever told you this. Uh, when, when, when I decided to move, uh, to, uh, move from Miami, Florida, um, uh, my dad is a... He was a, a, a growing believer, okay? He was really starting to get interested in the scriptures and all. And I remember him calling me one day and he said, would you do me a favor? I said, sure, anything, Pop. We called him Pop. Um, he said, before you move, would you buy me a Bible just like yours and a Bible case just like yours? Okay, well, you know what? The request of a father is a command, right? <laughs> sure enough, boy, I, I made sure of it. He said, I'll pay for it. I said, no, no, no. I made sure of it. I got him one exactly like mine. Uh, back then it was a, a New Schofield reference Bible, and, and I got the Bible cover. It was a wide margin, uh, New Schofield, and I got that, and I bought it for him, and I gave it to him, moved to Colorado. Uh, we were out there for a year anyway. Um, long story short, come back at Christmas time, come back later at different times. What he would do, uh, he was so into it, what he, what he would do is he would have pages of Bible questions to ask me from his reading. Now, here's the thing. I said, well, let me see how you're doing. Uh, I noticed you have markers, okay? He was using wet markers. He didn't know any better zealously wanting to learn. But anyways, here's, here's the way he would read. God bless him, okay? But this, this, is, this fits into this, okay? No fault of his own. No one had taught him. He would read a page, and then if there were lots of notes underneath it, he would read every note, every word of every note, just like he was reading the Bible, okay? This is the natural tendency, in a study Bible, you read the text, you read the notes. And this is what he was doing. He was highlighting verses, and he was also highlighting stuff in the notes. Next page, he would do the same thing. That is how he read his Bible. Okay? Now, it is a way to learn, but do you see the danger in it if your study Bible has got error in the notes? Those notes are telling you something about the text that's not true. And that is a Trojan horse. You need to be aware of that. Of course, I talked it over with him. He understood it, and, uh, and it wasn't a problem after that. See, there is a tendency to trust those notes on the same level as Scripture. That is just human nature. There is also a tendency to go... Now, here's where it really gets dangerous... There is also a tendency to go to them first to understand the text instead of the text itself. Why? It's, it's just easy. That's why. Right? That's human nature. Well, I don't understand that verse. What do they say down here? That's human nature to do that. That's why if you're going to use a study Bible, you ought to use one that is sound, okay, that the notes are better or that you get the best notes that you can possibly get in that study Bible. Now, here's what's going on in the world, folks. Study Bibles are getting thicker and thicker, or as some children would say, thickerer 
and thickerer. And what is happening is this. Now, I'm, I'm going to show this one to you, and I'm not, I'm not, this is just an example. I'm not faulting Henry Morris. Henry Morris was a, was a um, uh, you know, the modern father of creationism, a biblical creationism and all that. But this was the latest work that he did before he, he went home to be with the Lord. The Henry Morris Study Bible. All right? Now, let me, let me show you. This is, this is what happened with this one. Now, this is in Genesis. Of course, Genesis is one of his specialties as far as his, his field of study. Now, I want you to, can you see it? This is Scripture. These are the notes. Okay? Now, he had a lot to say about Genesis because he was a geologist and scientist. So that's why there's so much here. But this is not unusual today for study Bibles. Now, I'm not tearing this down. I'm just saying, do you see the potential problem that there could be? Every word of God is true. He's a shield unto them to put their trust in him. Add thou not to his words. I'm not saying Dr. Morris, as a matter of fact, he was a, he was a strong defender of the faith, even the King James Bible, by the way, and, and believed the Bible was the Word of God. Okay? He was a fundamentalist, is what he was. So I, I'm not tearing him down. What I'm saying, though, is, is this. You need to be careful if you're going to use a study Bible or a commentary, which is a book that is like a big study Bible. It, 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 you need to be careful of what it is saying. See, here's the truth. The Bible isn't getting any thicker. So what is going on? Do you see where I'm going with this? This is important. I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach on this or talk about this before, but it needs to be addressed. Here's the problem, though, today. As we have seen in this series already with Calvinism, with Lordship Salvation, with corruption in the text of Scripture that we covered last week, with so much false teaching out there today, this is a serious problem. People are learning and passing down error through the notes of these study Bibles and commentaries. Again, not all of them, and then not every passage. But error is being passed down. And the more that, is, the more that people put into them, the more chance there is of error being a part of it. Think about this, okay? The vast majority of your Bible colleges are compromising on the gospel. They don't have the gospel right. The vast majority of your Bible colleges today do not believe in a literal six-day creation anymore. Okay? The vast majority of them are lordship salvation, teaching lordship salvation. Many of them, which used to be dispensational schools, are now moving towards Reformed theology and rejecting that. Many of them don't believe in a literal hell anymore. This is the way the men are being taught. This is the way they're being educated and trained, okay, in many of the colleges today. Now, those professors in the colleges, they're the ones who are editing the study Bibles. So they're the ones who are influencing the text of the study Bibles and who are writing the commentaries. Do you see the problem here? You've got Calvinism, you've got lordship salvation, legalism, you've got corruption in the Bible text, and now you've got people who are taking all of that and saying, you know what, we'll put this in a new study Bible or a commentary. And so what do people do? They're, they're thinking, well, you know what, I'd like to learn, about, I'd like to learn, uh, uh, I don't understand, I, I want a commentary on Romans. And so they'll go to Romans and they'll, and they'll get a commentary written by a reform theologian, okay, or somebody who doesn't believe in, in the, uh, the uh, biblical plan for Israel. And then they'll go to Romans 9, 10, and 11, look at the commentary, and that commentary will teach them false doctrine, 
And they'll believe it. Why? It's because of the power of print. The power of print. The more that is put into them, the more chance there is of error being a part of it. Commentaries. Now, listen. And I hope you're getting the big picture of this, okay? Again, I'm not against study Bibles per se. I'm not against commentaries. I am not against them. I am a pastor, and I realize that our job is to teach and preach the Word of God. And in a sense, we are preaching... We are preaching an ongoing commentary. As time goes on, especially those of us who do a lot of verse-by-verse preaching and teaching of the Scriptures. But we must be careful about what we're saying. This is no light matter. If we say the Bible says this, it better say that. Because we're accountable to God for what we say. We're accountable. Okay? Now, I hope one day, it's a matter of time and effort to do it, I hope one day to have a, at least a New Testament commentary that will be available. Okay, I've been through the entire New Testament and many books more than once, and I hope to have that available on the Internet one day. It's one of the goals I have. We'll see. Hopefully it'll happen. But uh, that'll be free. You just go to a website, and the whole commentary will be there. It will be expository notes, basically. Uh, My preaching notes expanded a little bit, and it'll be a living commentary to where as I go on and I learn new things, I'll just keep adding, adding, adding to that resource. And it'll be free to anybody who wants to use it. I don't know how many people will want to use it, but it'll be there just in case they do. Here's the point, though. I better be careful what I say. Because I'm going to give an account to God for it. And folks, when you buy a commentary or you buy a study Bible, you better be careful what you're buying. Because I guarantee you there are things in there that are not going to be... Well, you're not going to agree with them if you're sound, doctrinally sound in the faith. There's Bible study software, Bible software. Now, I started using Bible software early... As far as pastors using Bible software, I saw the the advantage of it. I started using it back in 1988-1989. It's a long time ago. It often integrates study Bibles and commentaries into it. Today, of course, we have phones and we have apps on our on our iPads and, and tablets and so forth. And that's those apps are Bible software, is what really what they are. It's the same idea. It is a great tool, and it provides a much deeper level of study. And I still use Bible study software, and I believe in it with all of my heart. But, as the libraries continue to get bigger and bigger, remember these companies, their program, their basic Bible study program, is only worth so much by itself, for them to stay in business, they have to keep adding resources, adding resources, adding resources. Listen to me today. The vast majority of resources that are being added to Bible study software is Calvinistic Lordship Salvation Theology. The vast majority of what's coming out today is that. As the libraries continue to get bigger and bigger, you can get away from the Scripture itself and spend all your time reading what somebody else says about the Bible and not what the Bible says itself. As a matter of fact, at least one program that I know of, Logos, some people know what that is, most popular one, as far as high end, they actually bring you, this is one way you can use the program, they will actually bring you suggested resources and helps and basically build a message for you. The software will do that for you. 
Now, you have the ability to get into it and make changes that you want as far as putting a document together to teach and preach, but they'll go and they'll say, okay, well, what do you want this on? And, and you say, okay, I want to I wanna do a message on this. And it'll go and get stuff and say, here's your stuff to use. Now, if all you had was biblically sound resources... It wouldn't be terrible. I could never do it that way, okay? I I just, I don't want somebody doing my work for me. I love to discover on my own. That's the stuff that God really blesses when the Holy Spirit shows it to you. But here's the point. When it goes and gets those resources and it says, here you go, how do you know that those resources are doctrinally sound? You don't know unless you know. Unless you know who you can trust and who you cannot. Now, here's the thing about apps on your phone and also Bible study software. When you're looking at resources on your screen, okay, Thomas Constable's commentary, which, by the way, I think that's the best one you can get. You may not agree with every single thing. I think he has the best commentary out there, the most consistent of all. And and, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but you can actually access his full commentary online for free. The whole Bible, okay? And I'm not saying I agree with every single thing he's ever said, but by and large, I I read him on James chapter 2 this morning, and I was blessed out of my skin. I actually had to go find my skin to get back in it before I came to church. (laughs) Here's the point. You could have Constable's commentary open, and next to it you could have John MacArthur's commentary open. And when you're dealing with them on a screen, they look exactly the same. Exactly the same. Now, you might say, well, you can, I mean, if you just look, you can see which one it is. Yeah, but most people don't think that way. Most people are just there, oh, let me just open up all these commentaries, and then you just start reading commentaries, start reading commentaries. Some good information, some bad, and before you know it, you got a weird idea. Where'd you get the weird idea? You didn't get it from this. You got it from man. You need to be careful. We need to be careful. See, folks, here's the truth of it. This is how error perpetuates and multiplies itself over time within the body of Christ. It is like a virus. You talk to somebody who's messed up and, and they're, they're believing lordship salvation or giving a false gospel, and you, and you sit down with them and you find out, well, they're a believer, they got, they got saved early in life, but they got polluted. And you sit them down and they, and they see what you're saying and they say, Well, I don't know how I ever got so messed up on this. I can tell you how you got messed up. By reading the works of men and not the Word of God. The Word of God never leads a person astray. Never, never, never. It is safe. It's when we get to the works of men that this becomes dangerous. And when you then put in your study Bible, you put the works of men under the text of Scripture, now you need to be careful. I'm not saying throw your study Bible away. I'm just saying you need to be careful. It can be a Trojan horse. And obviously there are some study Bibles better than others. But this is how it perpetuates. I've had people ask me for, Pastor, why in the world do people believe this stuff? I mean, they, they just keep believing it. This person believes it. And I'll say, what kind of study Bible are they using? Well, they're using MacArthur Study Bible. There you go. Or they're using this study Bible or that. Well, there you go. That's why they believe it. Well, why is my pastor in another church? Why is my pastor preaching this and that? I say, what what? What resources is he studying with? That'll tell you. Who trained him? See, folks, if we get away from Scripture and we focus on man, we are facing a danger, a real danger, a real Trojan horse in the church. Turn with me to James chapter 3. 
James chapter 3. In verse 1, it says this, My brethren, be not many masters. Now, masters in the King James means a teacher, is what it means. Okay? Uh, we, there's the term schoolmaster. It's the idea of a school teacher. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. There's greater judgment to the one who's teaching because people are going to believe what you say. So you better be right because you're going to be accountable to that. Can you imagine someone standing before God? Why did you teach people a false gospel? Well, that's what I learned. And God would say, well, I'm not saying what he would say, but the point would be this, you didn't learn it from me. That's the point that God would have for that person. The best Bible study tools that I know of, I'll make this simple for you today, a Bible, King James Bible, Strong's Hebrew Greek Concordance and Lexicons, and a, work, a resource called the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. It's 500,000 cross-references of any text. Now, let me say this. Strong's is not perfect, and some of the cross-references in, in Treasury will not always be exactly where it should be. But by and large, those three resources will give you such rich Bible study all the rest is dessert. Anything else? Those are the three things that every believer needs to have. And by the way, if you're using any Bible app or Bible apps, Bible software and all that, those three things are usually part of that resource, such as eSword. It's all free. That's all free. Keep that in mind. Okay? Uh, look with me to Acts 17. Acts 17. See, here's where we need to be as believers. Acts 17. It's talking about the Bereans. And it says in Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They were anxious to learn the word of God and searched the scriptures daily whether those things be so. That's what we need to do. So if you have a study Bible and you're, you're, you're reading the text, and you look at the note, and you say, boy, that doesn't sound right. Search it out. Search it out. You may end up saying, you know what? I can't use the study Bible any longer. This, there's just too much junk in here for me. But see, here's the problem we face today, folks. A lot of people don't want to study today. They just want someone to tell them what it says. We're lazy we're lazy. And so second point today, and I've already touched on it many times, but the problem it can often produce is this. Study Bibles, commentaries, and software, they can introduce false doctrine into the life of the person who owns it. The first two Trojan horses we covered, Calvinism, Lordship, Salvation, have infected the vast majority of study Bibles and commentaries today. Not all of them, and certainly not to all, like, full levels or whatever. There are some commentaries that overall they're good to have, but there are areas in those commentaries that it's like, oh, this is awful. This is awful. Okay? Some of my heroes in the faith... When I was young in the Lord and, and, and looking at their stuff and, and learning and all that, uh, I, over time, as I've read more and more and more, it's like, well, he's not as much of a hero as they were at one time. Okay? Now, none of us are perfect. I get that. I'm just saying we need to be careful because false doctrine has infected the vast majority of study Bibles today and commentaries. Now, listen, again, stepping back, looking at the big picture. With the hundreds, hundreds of new study Bibles coming out on the market, and new translations 
flooding the market today. Why are the people so strange in their beliefs? And why are they caught up in every wind of doctrine? It's because of false resources. This book will never lead you astray. Ever. Ever. That's why some Christians, matter of fact, many Christians, prefer not to have a study Bible. They prefer to have a Bible that they study with. And so they'll have a Bible, and does that mean they don't have any other resources? No, they may have resources, but they leave the text alone in Scripture, okay? Very important. Now, I have five passages very quickly this morning, and I'm only going to read you information. We're not going to put it on the screen, so I want you to listen carefully because of time. Five passages that provide an acid test... <laughs> For the worth of your study Bible, as far as doctrinal integrity, or commentary. Five passages. In other words, if I was going to go to a Bible bookstore, of course they don't exist anymore, I don't think. Maybe in the South they have a few. But if you're going to go to a Bible bookstore, let's say somebody comes out with a new Bible a couple years ago. Okay? Some people won't like this. A couple years ago, uh, David Jeremiah came out with this study Bible. David Jeremiah, I like David Jeremiah. Yeah, a lot of the time, I like David Jeremiah a lot of the time. But what did I do? I, I was there at the Lifeway Family Store. I think that's what it's called down in Maple Grove before they close it, or Arbor Hills or whatever it's called down there. Isn't that a strange name for a place, Lifeway Family Store? Do you buy people there or what? Anyway, <laughs> opened it up. You know what I did? The first thing I did is started going to these key passages that I'm sharing with you today. Okay, what does he believe about this? What does he believe about that? That's what you do. You get a study Bible, or you're thinking of one, go to these key passages, see where they stand. That'll help, right? Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, and it lists a whole bunch of sins. In verse 21 it says this, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, the word do there, it does mean, pros it's the Greek word proso. It doesn't mean to do a single act. It does mean practice. It does mean that. So I'll give you that. But what is the passage talking about? Well, the flesh nature, the old nature, our sin nature, which does those things, that will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is in contrast to the new nature and the work of the Holy Spirit because right after that, those verses, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So this truth is in the middle of God's Word in the book of Galatians teaching us that we should use our liberty, our freedom in Christ, to live for Christ and not live for the flesh because the flesh is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? But listen, the ESV study Bible. I won't read you the whole note, but it says this. Their outward conduct, those who do those sins, by the way, Christians still do those sins, right? By the way, Christians still live in sin, right? Christians do live in sin. It's not good, it's bad, they shouldn't be doing it, but they do. The ESV says this, their outward conduct indicates their inward spiritual status, that they are not born of God, do not have the Holy Spirit within, and are not God's true children. So if you do these things, you're not saved. That's in the ESV study Bible. Life application study Bible, very, very popular. Some of you have it. I know there's some good things in the, the LAB, that's what I call it, or LASB. Galatians 5.19, these desires include obvious sins such as sexual immorality, demonic activities, and it goes on and says this, those who ignore such sins or refuse to deal with them reveal that they have not received the gift of the Spirit that leads to a transformed life. In other words, they're not saved. So if you are doing these sins and you're not dealing with it, you're not saved. There it is again. That's lordship salvation. Defenders. 
much as I love Dr. Morris, Defender Study Bible, do such things. Here, quote, those who do such things, that is, habitually do such things, thereby indicate they are not really led by the Spirit and therefore not really saved. So if you're not led by the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit's not leading in your life, or you're not following the Spirit, you're not saved. Okay, how much do you have to follow the Spirit to be saved or to prove you're saved? How much do you not follow the Spirit to prove you're not saved? Now, I know enough about Dr. Morris that if you would have sat him down and said, Dr. Morris, do you believe salvation is the gift of God and it's not of works, lest any man should boast? Absolutely. Do you believe in eternal security? Absolutely. And then they'll come up with notes like that. Do you see the confusion that it breeds? It's a Trojan horse. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Boy, how in the world could you mess up Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? You'd be surprised. And by the way, I could give you so many examples. I have to be careful with my time. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Somebody I have high theological respect for. Okay? Overall. Overall. Some people won't like this. Charles Ryrie. A lot of you have met Charles Ryrie. Very gracious man. He wrote a book in rebuttal to John MacArthur as far as Lordship Salvation and all that. Yet in his study Bible, he's got areas where it's Lordship Salvation. Ryrie, study Bible. He says this, quote, salvation is by grace through faith. Faith involves knowledge of the gospel, etc. Then he says this, works cannot save, Ephesians 2.9, but good works always accompany salvation. You might say, well, that's not so bad. Well, he's really bad in James. I'll give you that, I think, yes, in just a minute. Let's go to James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead, right? The great passage. What is that? Faith without works is dead. In what sense? It's of no value because it's not helping anyone. If we have faith and are not exercising our faith as believers, our faith is not producing. It's idle. It's barren. It's useless. But that doesn't mean we're not saved. It means we're not serving. James 2.24, you see how that by works a man is justified not by faith only, down to verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, b- barren, it doesn't, mean a, it doesn't mean non-existent. So faith without works is dead also. Listen to this one. This is from, I don't even know exactly which Bible it is. It's a recent one that Nelson Bible Publishers, Nelson Bible Publishers produced. This is the introduction to the book of James. Are you sitting? This is the introduction. Faith without works cannot be called faith. Wait a minute. It's faith. It exists, but you're telling me it's not faith. That's that's insanity. That's an insane statement. Okay? I'm quoting, faith without works cannot be called faith. Faith without works is dead, 226. And dead faith is worse than no faith at all. What do you do with Ephesians 2, 8, 9? Faith must work. It must produce. It must be visible. Verbal faith is not enough. Mental faith is insufficient. Faith must be there, but it must be more. It must inspire action. Throughout his his epistle to Jewish believers, James integrates true faith and everyday practical experience by stressing that true faith must manifest itself in works of faith. So if you don't have works... You don't have faith, true faith. Anyways, folks, that is so heretical, I don't even know where to begin. 
It is such an awful statement. But there it is. That is the introduction to that Bible. And it's not even a study Bible. It's a reference Bible that Thomas Nelson recently put out. Dr. Ryrie, again, I, I, as much as I love Dr. Ryrie, he says this in James 2. He says, unproductive faith cannot save because it is not genuine faith. Faith and works are like, listen to this one, faith and works are like a two-coupon ticket to heaven. The coupon of works is not good for passage, and the coupon of faith is not valid if detached from works. That's lordship salvation. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting. John MacArthur quotes Dr. Ryrie in MacArthur. Using, he's using Ryrie to support his lordship salvation stance. He actually quotes Ryrie on this. And yet, if you were to sit down and talk to Ryrie, you would say, no, salvation's a total gift. Eternal security. All, all of that. See, folks, do you see the confusion this is breeding? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Be not deceived, or the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, etc. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified. Or excuse me. Uh, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Ryrie. And by the way, the Ryrie Study Bible is a beautiful Bible, the way it's laid out, and a lot of the notes are very helpful. I know some of you use it. I'm not shaming you or saying don't use it. I'm just saying we need to be careful. Ryrie says this, people whose lifestyles exhibit wickedness, not fruit, show they are unsaved and will therefore not inherit the kingdom of God. What? What? How can you be so strong and pure in the gospel sometimes and then come up with stuff like this? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Look, you wonder why people are confused. 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 John 3, 6 through 9, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You know the passage, okay? It's talking about the new nature does not commit sin. God's seed remains in us. He cannot sin because he's born of God. It's talking about the new nature of the believer. It's not talking about simply a saved person can't sin or can't practice sin. By the way, it isn't practice there. It is simply poeo. The ESV Study Bible. In other words, because the word is present in the believer's heart through the work of the Spirit, the believer cannot keep on sinning. Then it says, thus the hearts of genuine Christians, those who are truly children of God, have been so transformed that they cannot live in a pattern of continual sin. Though this does not mean that Christians are ever completely free from sin in this life. Okay, so you tell me how much of a pattern there can be and prove you're still saved. Do you, listen, I know I sound like a broken record today. A long one. LP. But do you see the point? This is where we find ourselves. So what's the solution to all of this? Give it to you very quickly. Number one, these, there are several things you could do. If you want, it's up to you. Buy a Bible with no notes. You'll never have a false doctrine in there. A Bible with no notes contains no false doctrine. KJV, no false doctrine. No notes, no false doctrine, absolutely pure. Isn't that great? Or maybe one with wide margins and put your own notes in it. As time goes on, over time you will develop a study Bible of your own. And tonight I'm going to be talking about how to do that. So you want to be here. It's very practical, very helpful. Come tonight, okay? Or, here's another solution, Ignore the notes. And a lot of you do that. And I get it. But see, you have discernment. You have discernment. Ignore the notes. Or you could do this. Now, this sounds radical. Get yourself a nice little thing of white out. And get in there and just white out 
those sentences that are not doctrinally sound if they bother you like they bother me. You might say, it doesn't really bother me. It bothers me, but that's me, okay? You could do that if you want. You might say, well, I'll just put lines through it or scribble on it. Well, that's going to put more attention to it. Maybe the best thing to do is just ignore it or just get a Bible that's plain like this. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, let's go over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Let me close with this. You might say, you've, you've given so much stuff, my head is spinning. Well, then... Just stop it for a minute and please listen to this because this is the main thing you need to understand today. When all is said and done, this is the bottom line. Okay? If you don't leave with anything else today, please leave with this. (laughs) It's the greatest thing you could ever have. I want to share with you how you can be sure of going to heaven today. Before you die, you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Let me explain it to you. This is what God has done for you this will be, this, I'll show you our problem, and then I'll show you what God has done. This hand representing you and me, let my wallet represent our sin. Here we are. The Bible says we are all sinners. We are all sinners. If you do one or if you do a million, we're all in the same boat. God loves us. He hates our sin. Our sin keeps us away, keeps us separated from him. Heaven's a perfect place. You have to be sinless to get in. We're all sinners, therefore we're not. Therefore, we can't go. You might say, well, I'll do my best. Doing your best will not make you perfect. Doing your best will not take away your sin. God says if we die with our sin, we'll be lost forever in hell. He doesn't want that for us. He loves us, hates our sin, but loves us. What he has done is this. He has provided for us the way to heaven. Because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves, he himself took on flesh, this hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took our sin upon himself, and he made the complete payment for sin. He made it, so we don't have to. See, if you die without Christ, you're saying, I'll take care of my own payment for sin. Jesus came and he did it for us. He took our sin upon himself. He made the payment He died, was buried, rose from the grave. And he says this in his word, that if you'll put your faith in him, if you'll trust in him as the one who died and paid for your sin, he'll give you everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't work for it. You don't keep it by what you do. The moment you believe, he gives you everlasting life. It's your possession forever and ever. It never stops no matter what. Well, what if, what if I sin in the future? You will. It's not good, but you will. But when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for that sin. There's not a sin you'll ever do that Jesus did not pay for. When you trust in him, the payment he made is good on your account. He gives you everlasting life. It's a free gift. Would you trust in him today as your Savior? Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ to get you to heaven, would you do it today? Would you do it today right where you sit? God knows your thoughts. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. Friend, he knows whether you're saved or not. And if you don't know where you're going when you die, you're probably not saved, not yet anyway. But would you put your faith in Jesus Christ right now, believe what he said? If you'll trust in him, he'll save you and he'll give you everlasting life. He'll never lose you, he'll never cast you out. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. If today you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd like to pray for you. Now, you don't have to do this. You're just indicating that you'd like prayer and that today you trusted Christ. But I'd like you to slip up your hand if today this made sense to you and today you trusted Christ. I won't embarrass you. You don't have to do that. But I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone with heads bowed and eyes closed who would say, yes, would you pray for me? Today I trusted Christ as Savior. I'd like prayer. Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? 
Now, Father, we thank you for your word. We do thank you, Father, that we have the word of God. I pray we would all be careful, Lord. We know that there is a place for study Bibles and commentaries. But, Father, they need to be sound. The material needs to be biblical to where it will help us, not confuse us. And we thank you, Father, for this time now. Give us a good afternoon, we ask. And uh, I pray you bring each one back tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.